coming up on today's message with Pastor Johnny. Uh, when Jesus does things, he does it by the Spirit. I said he just came out of the wilderness before he went to the synagogue. So he has spent some time on his own in praise and worship and prayer and fasting before he went to the place to talk about praise and worship. And somebody going to get this on the way. The, the worship was not only for the synagogue. The prayer was not only for the place of worship. He was praying first before he got to the church. Sometimes we don't come to the church for revelation. We ought to be coming to the church for confirmation. The prayer time should not only be at the church. to the gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter, starting with the 14th verse. Gospel according to Luke, fourth chapter, starting with the 14th verse, and when you have it, I ask all that are physically able to please stand. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee, and news of him went through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. And gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And then the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. And the people Amen. said, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. For the time that is ours to share together, I want to talk a little bit about marked safe. Marked safe. Facebook has a whole lot of functions. Some that are a little too nosy, but some that, that have some sort of value to them. Uh, and they have a function that allows you, they have several functions that allow you to let everyone know if you are safe. If there is a hurricane or a flood or a tornado or some other natural disaster, you can go on Facebook and let all your family members and Facebook friends know that you are safe. Not only can you let them know you're safe, but you can also let them know where you are. In a massive disaster such as uh, Katrina or Ike or most recently Harvey, one of the hardest challenges is finding the people who need to be rescued. Because see, in a situation like that, everybody gets on the phone and it clogs up the phone line, so they go down. And, and the ones that are still working after they've been clogged up, uh, they have a bunch of voice calls. People are talking on them. And so it would take days for 911 uh, operators to listen and log thousands of individual distress Calls And even when the voice calls do get through, when you are able to talk to somebody, you're probably on the move. Mm -hmm. And so the information you give them now is not going to be of any value to the rescue operator coming to save you an hour from now because you've been on the move. Uh, some of us were, uh, some, some of the people in this building were caught in the flood and had to move from location to location. And so... Moment by moment, the information changes. All right. But voice calls 
are not the only communication that goes through these towers. Uh, many uh, other things go through the towers, such as uh, the, so many social media users, such as Facebook customers, have their location services on in their phone. And they're constantly sending the signal from their phone to Facebook, and it lets them know where they are, pinpointing their location, even when they're not making calls. So somebody at Facebook was smart enough to see the value in the fact that because you have Facebook on your phone and your phone tells Facebook where you're at, maybe we should use that in case of a disaster. And so they had a service that was called Disaster Maps. During a disaster, Facebook locate, uh, collects all the location data, all the people with Facebook accounts near the disaster, and the authorities can use that information to coordinate rescues. The National Guard needs to know where to deploy its big wheel rescue vehicles. Paramedics need to know where to position their rigs for a quick response time. The Red Cross needs to plot the busiest crossroads to set up their mobile soup kitchens. Disaster maps tell officials in disaster response command centers where the largest group of people are located. Facebook also has another feature called Safety Check that allows users to check in with the friends and family and let them know that they've met a place of safety. And when they get someplace safe, they can go on Facebook and, 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 say, and make a post and say that this person is marked safe. And so Facebook also uses that data on your phone in real time and in not real time, those who pull post it later, and they are able to mark the people safe. The disaster may still be going on, Amen. but you've gotten information from the people that you are on your way out of it. Uh, being marked safe has become so commonplace, people use it for jokes. After the uh, Dallas Cowboys were removed from the playoffs, people went on Facebook and posted that they are marked safe for another year from hearing We Them Boys. <laughs> The same thing happened when the Saints got eliminated, jobbed, robbed, stolen from out the playoffs as well. When people marked safe, then we are uh, marked safe from another year of hearing the who that. But the point is that it's become commonplace and there's a way to let everybody know that you may still be in a little trouble, but you have gotten out of the midst of it. You're on your way out. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You can see your way to the end, and you have marked yourself safe. I thought about that passage as I read this lectionary. I thought about that item when, when I uh, read this passage, and, and I looked at it the same way, and Jesus was letting the people know that they could be marked safe. Uh, this passage that I read in your hearing uh, takes place after the temptations in the wilderness. And, and Jesus comes in by the power of the what? The Spirit. Uh, Luke's text indicates that before reaching Nazareth, Jesus was already engaged in the preaching and teaching stage of his ministry. But both Mark 6 and, and Matthew 13 have similar tales of when Jesus comes and returns to his hometown and is later rejected. But those gospel writers place it at a later place in the ministry. But it's there. And so Jesus is going around to numerous synagogues. And as was his custom, he went regularly to the synagogue. All right. As was his custom, mm, he went regularly to the synagogue. As right. was right. his custom. Amen. And you hear it in verses 14 and 15, and it's going to come up again in verses 31 and 32 when you read it at home. And again in 42 and 44, he goes regularly. Now, that's not a slight on those who don't go, because I said last week, I learned that only 17% of people go to church on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And that 17% is divided up amongst Jews, Hebrews, and Muslims. I mean, uh, not, not Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And I would argue that maybe the problem is not with the 83%, that only 17%. 
is, hello, all the amens went away. Right. What happened? What happened? The microphone's still working? But if we're going to be like Jesus, we ought to be able to do things like Jesus. And Jesus went regularly. The synagogue was used for teaching and worship. And Luke gives us the earliest explanation of corporate worship outside of going to the big temple in Jerusalem for annual celebrations. The synagogue became the main place of worship after the temple was destroyed. But the point is, if you're going to be a believer, if you're going to be a disciple, if you're going to grow in this thing called faith, you need to be around like-minded believers. I can't say I'm going to get in shape if I don't ever hang around people that don't exercise. Or if I hang around the wrong people. And so the synagogue became a main place of worship and Jesus was going to numerous synagogues. It was good enough for Jesus. It can be good enough for us. And so he went from the numerous synagogues to the Nazareth synagogue. And, and what he reads is in Isaiah. And I, it's interesting that Jesus didn't pick the text. The text was handed to him. And Jesus stood up for the reading of scripture. Yeah. Jesus stood up Amen. for the reading of scripture. Yeah. Jesus stood up right. for the reading of scripture. And he read From Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and Isaiah 58 and 6, the prophet describes the supernatural ministry of the Messiah. Reading from the Isaiah scroll, he declares that the Holy Spirit has anointed him to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim the release of the captives, and to recover the sight of the blind, to let the oppressed go free for these Uh, People, these children of God, his mission was to proclaim the good news, the gospel, announcing the year of the Lord. I find it interesting that he chose to read Isaiah in this time. I find it interesting that the book of Isaiah was handed to him because the book of Isaiah was written to a people who had been separated from their homeland. The book of Isaiah was written to people who were oppressed. The book of Isaiah was written to people who were broke, busted, and disgusted. The people of Isaiah were people who were rude, who were under some corrupt leadership. And here it is, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he goes to the people where they are. He decides to speak to the people, not the ones that got it all together, not the ones that walk on water, not the ones that can walk through the rain and not get wet, not the ones that have arrived. He goes to the people who are the oppressed, those who are down and out, those who are looking for a leg up, and he lets them know that I am here. Ah, yes, indeed. He says, then it's good news that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, When Jesus does things, he does it by the spirit. I said he just came out of the wilderness before he went to the synagogue. So he has spent some time on his own in praise and worship and prayer and fasting before he went to the place to talk about praise and worship and Somebody going to get this on the way. The the worship was not only for the synagogue. The prayer was not only for the place of worship. He was praying first before he got to the church. Sometimes we don't come to the church for revelation. We ought to be coming to the church for confirmation. The prayer time should not only be at the church. He was moved by the spirit. He had been fasting and praying out in the wilderness and then was tempted and then came to the church. What he does, he does with the spirit. What he does, he does with the word. What he does, he does in prayer and fasting. He doesn't just pull something out of his backside. There was a time of preparation before he acted. The Holy Spirit was on Jesus before he acted. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was drawn out of the wilderness by the power of the spirit. We ought to be incorporating the power of the spirit in our day-to-day lives. We ought to be uh, uh, bringing in the power of the spirit in our work. We ought to be bringing in the power of the spirit on our jobs. We ought to be bringing the power of the spirit at school. We ought to be bringing the power of the spirit in our day-to-day actions. With only Bible, some people will read. With only sermons, some people will ever hear. And if they're going to read us as a Bible, if they're going to hear us as a sermon, it ought to be something put on by 
the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord was upon me. And he anointed him. The, the, the process of anointing, the procedure of rubbing or smearing, smearing oil on a person or a thing uh, for the purpose of healing, for setting apart or embalming. A person can anoint themselves, be anointed, or anoint another person or thing. And from ancient times, the priests and kings were ceremonially anointed as a sign of an official appointment to office and as a symbol of God's power upon them. The act had an element of awe to it when you anointed something and the spirit of the Lord was on Jesus and he was anointed to do some things, healing the brokenhearted. Uh, the Bible says there is no earthly sorrow that heaven cannot heal. These people were sitting under corrupt leadership. Things that were rightfully theirs were taken from them and they were trying to pick up the pieces and make something of this thing called life. And that has caused some heartache, some sadness, some depression. They do not know where their help is coming from and it hurts. And Jesus is here to provide some relief. If only some of us could admit that we were really broken hearted. We grow up in an age where you can't be emotional. You can't be in your feelings. You got to keep a mask on. You got to skin and grin and smile all the time and lie to people every day. When they tell you how you're doing, I'm fine. I'm great. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm blessed and highly favored. But the fact of the matter is that some of us are broken. We went through hell and high water to get here today. And we ought to be able to bring that to Jesus. Heal the broken hearted. But we got to admit that we're broken hearted at first. We ought to be able to have that talk with Jesus. But not only have that talk with Jesus, have that talk with a therapist. Check, check, two, two. Microphone, check, one, two, hey, hey. Sometimes it ain't a demon. Sometimes it ain't a demon. Sometimes you need to talk to a counselor. Some of those things that have happened, we can be 55 years old and still living from trauma from five years old because we ain't talked about it. Jesus can heal the brokenhearted. But sometimes we also need to do some things about it. He healed the brokenhearted. And proclaim liberty to the captives. And that word used here for liberty does not appear anywhere else in the New Testament. But he's here to let these people know that you have been free. Sometimes you have to tell the people they are free long before they can actually be free. Sometimes you got to tell them over and over again that they're free. Before they realize they are free. Because if they're not free up here, they'll never be free. And so he's coming to proclaim liberty to the captives, those who are oppressed in recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus is helping the blind see both those who cannot physically see, but also those who are looking for a Messiah. Isaiah prophesied that the Savior was coming here and Jesus was going to be a light for the nations. They were looking for the Messiah, but they were blind to them. And Jesus was letting them know that they were going to get their sight back. You looking for the Messiah? Here I am. And to set at liberty the oppressed. This was a release, a release for the oppressed, economically oppressed, the physically oppressed oppressed, the politically oppressed, those being released from bondage and those under the bondage of sin, he's letting them know that they are free. They no longer have to be oppressed. Jesus is here to let them know they are free and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. When they were talking about this acceptable year of the Lord, uh, they were talking about Jubilee. 
Uh, Jubilee is found in your Old Testament in Leviticus 25. And there was a, you, when people, I'm going to stop here because this part wasn't part of the sermon, but I'm going to just put this in. I, I, I've been on this kick. I've been dealing with a bunch of people who, who, who uh, talk about how the Bible promotes slavery. And they use the Bible uh, as, 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 uh, as, uh, the, to talk about these 400 plus years of oppression that happened to people of color in this state, in, in this, in this state and in this nation to build the nation on the backs of our ancestors. And there are people that have a problem with the Bible because they say that the Bible promotes slavery. Yes, the Bible does talk about slavery. But part of the problem is, is when they were using the Bible on the slaves, they also didn't want them to read. Amen. They weren't allowed to learn how to read because if they would have learned, to, if they were allowed to learn how to read, they'd understood that the slavery and the servitude that was going on in the Bible was absolutely nothing like that happened to our people. Absolutely Amen. nothing. There was nothing in there encouraging the separation of families. There was nothing in there that encouraged buck breaking. There was nothing in there that encouraged the people to have slaves as mistress and house Negroes and field Negroes. There was nothing in there. When people were enslaved in the Bible, that was to work off a debt. And the debt couldn't have been longer than seven years. And, and, and in, if there would have been some time, if, if enough of them knew to read, they'd all, all they'd had to do was get to Leviticus 25 and understood that there was a time over periods of time where all the debts were wiped clean, whether the balance was paid off or not. And that was the year of Jubilee. All the debts were wiped clean. They wasn't letting people off the plantation every seven years. The slavery that they're talking about then is not the slavery that we suffered under. Right? Our ancestors suffered under. But Jesus is not only letting them know that their physical and their economic and their political oppression and those debts that are going on are being wiped free. They're also going to be wiped free of sin. Oh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And when the sinners plunge beneath that flood, they lose all their guilty stains. Jesus is here to let them know that they are wiped clean in the acceptable year of the Lord. Their debt is wiped clean. And so that's what he read when he read Isaiah. And so he read Isaiah and that talked about what he read, but they also talked about in the text what he says. Jesus stood up for the reading of scripture, All right. but he sat down yes. for the sermon. Yes, sir. And the sermon, the text only gives us one sentence of the sermon. Mm-hmm. I don't know why the author only takes one sentence from the sermon, but I know that that one sentence is good enough for me. Amen. Jesus said everything I just read. About the spirit of the Lord being upon me and, 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 and anointing me to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Everything I just read in your hearing is right before you. Amen. Everything that I just told you about that was coming is right before your eyes. Isaiah wrote that text looking for a a liberator and Jesus rolled back up the scroll, put it back to the attendant and let him know that everything I just said is here. Your liberator is here and you can mark yourself safe. You can mark yourself safe in him. Jesus said that he is the Messiah that Isaiah wrote about. I am here. Everything you just read came true right in front of you. You can mark yourself safe in him. The brokenhearted. I got healing for your broken heart. Mark yourself safe. Captives, Jesus is here to liberate you. Mark yourself safe. Those that are blinded, Jesus is here to give you sight. Mark yourself safe. Those that are oppressed, you can set yourself free in Jesus. Mark yourself safe. Jesus was letting you know that this was the year of Jubilee. You can mark yourself safe. And that was only the beginning. That was the beginning of his mes- 
scripture. He was out going to go out and feed 5,000 people on two fish and five loaves of bread. He was going to walk on water. He was going to heal the sick. He was going to raise the dead. He was going to open up the blinded eyes. He was going to set the captives free. Mark yourself safe. He was going to get accused of a crime he didn't commit. But because he got accused, we can mark ourselves safe. He was going to get beat with a cat of nine tails. But because he got beat, we can mark ourselves safe. He was going to wear a crown of thorns. But because he wore that crown of thorns, we can mark ourselves safe. He was going to get blindfolded and beat. And they was going to say, prophesy, Jesus. Tell us which one of us hit you. But because he took those beatings, I can mark myself safe. He was going to carry a cow cross all the way to Calvary. But because he carried that cross, I can mark myself safe. He was going to get nails in his hands and pierced in his side and wear a crown of thorns on his head. But because he did that, I can mark myself safe. And he was going to die and get put in a borrowed tomb. But he wasn't going to be there long. That's why it was borrowed. But early on the third day, he was going to get up with all power in his hands. And he's coming back again. Will you be ready? Can you mark yourself safe? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come. Thank you for listening to this message. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you found this message. If this message blessed you, be a blessing to someone else and share it. Connect with Pastor Johnny on Instagram and Twitter, and be sure to like Faith UMC Dickinson on Facebook. 